The first step in the uh, treatment and diagnosis of glioblastoma is typically a surgical um, uh, approach. Uh, we need to find out what the diagnosis is, and that's where the neurosurgery comes in. Um, the, um, the, the type of intervention heavily depends on the location of the tumor. Um, uh, some tumors are amenable to uh, resection, um, and these can frequently be completely removed. Uh, completely meaning um, every, everything that's visible or, or visible disease, because we, we know that even most complete resections will always leave behind microscopic disease. Um, however, uh, what we call gross total resection can frequently be achieved in patients um, who do not have tumors in eloquent areas of the brain. Uh, in cases where uh, the tumor is located uh, in deep structures, let's say in thalamus uh, or somewhere in the brainstem, um, then uh, surgical resection is not feasible because that would be associated with significant risk to the patient and, and causing neurological damage. Uh, so in those cases, uh, patients would undergo uh, a biopsy. And there are two types of biopsy that we can consider. One is uh, open biopsy, which allows us to obtain more tissue. Uh, it's sometimes called a micro-resection. Um, and then there's a needle biopsy. And uh, each approach has uh, pros and cons. Uh, there are different risks associated with, uh, with these approaches, but I think the, the major one that we uh, fear in neuro-oncology is the fact that we may not obtain diagnostic tissue. Um, there is um, a sampling uh, problem with uh, needle biopsies. Uh, we know that uh, brain tumors, specifically glioblastoma, are not very homogeneous, so they may um, harbor islands of histologies that are pot potentially uh, higher grade, like grade four, and some other parts of the lesion could be um, of, a, of, a different, uh, of a different grade. And if we happen to um, encounter only the, the lower grade areas, uh, we might um, have a diagnostic error. Uh, so in general, whenever possible, we prefer uh, to uh, offer either open biopsy uh, or better yet, uh, resection. Um, and the, the reason for that is also the fact that uh, patients who can undergo uh, more extensive resections um, have better survival. Uh, it has been shown um, by multiple studies that uh, resections of the tumor, 98% uh, of the tumor or more, uh, translates into better survival. Uh, so our goal always is to offer um, resection to the patients uh, whenever possible and safe. So it, glioblastoma, it's actually been known for quite some time uh, that surgery uh, has, does really impact on the survival of the patient. This, and for a long time, that's all we had. We, all we had was surgery followed by radiation. Chemotherapy only became important in 2005 when the first positive uh, trial really was done in the United States, uh, was really done in Europe and Canada. Um, and, but what they found was if you could get at least 95% of the tumor out, uh, you would impact positively on survival. And that was basically back in sort of the 80s that they did that with modern neurosurgical techniques. And then more recently, uh, in the last several years, UC San Francisco has published these really nice papers going back in their, uh, in their database of radiology to show that if they could get out 80% of the tumor or more, that they would impact on survival. So I'm a firm believer in getting out as much uh, tumor as you can safely. And if the surgeon is, thinks that they could get out at least 80% of it out, uh, we'll definitely do that. In other cases, I recommend surgery because patients in the, in the, who are getting treatment for glioblastoma need to undergo six weeks of radiation. That's a, it's a small amount of radiation daily, but it does kill the tumor cells over that period of time. So you have to have a large mass that's there. The brain is a, is a sponge in basically a very hard box. And when they're smelling, there's not a lot of uh, swelling. There's not a lot of room to go. The tumor basically gets the, pushes the brain down. And that's what's called herniation. That can be life. Uh, uh, it can be threatening to life, actually. So what we'll talk very carefully again in these tumor boards with surgeons, or even before when the person first gets admitted, is have the surgery and try to take at least even 50% of it out because that gives space for when we go, come after the tumor, they have a chemo radiation for the cells to die and swell and the patient doesn't have a lot of side effects with it. In terms of uh, novel imaging techniques, um, the uh, research is rapidly um, evolving. Um, we uh, are now having uh, ability to use uh, very strong uh, MRI um, scans. Um, and the strength of the scan is usually uh, 
uh, given in Teslas. Uh, we um, used to have the sort of a first or maybe initial generation magnets um, had a small strength of 0.0.5, 1, 1.5 Tesla. Now we have um, MRIs with a strength of 3, 3.5 Tesla and even 7 Tesla, which are mostly research uh, uh, machines. Um, the, the higher the strength of the magnet, the, the better the resolution um, of the MRI scan, um, which can help uh, the surgeon um, identify um, the lesion better um, and also uh, can help us see if there is any residual disease um, after surgical intervention. Um, some MRI um, uh, machines also have the ability to uh, obtain uh, the test called MR tractography, uh, which uh, uh, again allows us to identify the location of the lesion in relationship to uh, important uh, um, motor or sensory uh, tracts in the brain um, and that in turn can allow a surgeon to plan surgery accordingly and uh, hopefully avoid uh, these structures uh, during uh, surgical intervention. Uh, to take it a little bit a little, one more step further um, there's also ability to use MRI during surgery um, it's called intra-op, intraoperative MRI, um, when um, the patient um, and uh, the surgeon um, have the ability to use the MRI while the, the procedure is going on. Um, this again allows the surgeon to verify by MRI um, every now and then during the procedure uh, how much of the tumor has been removed, is there anything left, uh, does he need to go back um, and, and sort of do a little bit more uh, extensive resection. Um, Intra-op MRIs are becoming uh, more and more uh, popular, uh, more hospitals are acquiring them uh, and more surgeons uh, are uh, comfortable using them. So I think we're going to see um, in the future um, expansion of this technology uh, into um, the therapy of brain tumors, not just glioblastoma, but probably also metastatic disease and in the low-grade gliomas. Uh, in terms of other uh, modalities, uh, we sometimes use uh, MR spectroscopy. Uh, this is a test that sometimes can allow us to identify if the lesion is more of a higher grade or a lower grade. Um, uh, this could uh, potentially, in some cases, guide uh, a surgeon um, in terms of obtaining a biopsy sample uh, from the area of a high grade uh, versus low grade. Um, it's not a very uh, specific technology. Uh, uh, yet certainly, you know, one of the um, adjunctive technologies that can, you know, help in treatment planning. Um, other tests that we sometimes employ include uh, brain PET. It's a metabolic test uh, that allows us to identify uh, the, um, the areas in the brain where metabolic activity is uh, abnormal. Um, and this, in cases of malignant brain tumors, can in turn uh, tell us, um, it can sort of help us distinguish um, a live tumor from, uh, let's say, scar tissue or radiation necrosis. Um, we employ this test uh, quite frequently at my center, especially in um, cases where uh, we are suspecting that the lesion in question could be a result of prior treatment, mostly radiation, um, and that allows us to, uh, to get a better confidence in, in the interpretation of the MRI than uh, decision making regarding you know, what should we do, should we wait it out, should we treat it as tumor, uh, or maybe should we do something different um, for the patient.